Howdy, Central. It's a good day to be here. And, uh, you know, I just want to say something because I, I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure when the last time I've said something like this before is, but, you know, when we gather on Sunday, we, we acknowledge certain people. I mean, you see people that are serving, and you, you probably come up to some of our, our vocalists and instrumentalists sometimes and say, man, great job, and you'd say that to your Sunday school teacher and stuff. But, you know, the only time our technical people ever hear, ever hear from us is when something goes wrong. You get feedback, they hear it. Video goes down, they hear it. Lights flicker, (laughs) stop it. (laughs) This is one reason we don't talk about them too much. They're difficult. (laughs) Hey, I've been asking them to make me sound like Morgan Freeman for two years. And they haven't done it yet. But... um, you know, on a day like this when we don't have any issues, let's just take a minute to say thank you to these folks that, that do all this. And I can tell you, when we have issues, it's not their fault. In fact, we have folks here about 7.30 every Sunday morning fixing everything that breaks every Sunday morning. And uh, a bunch of them you can't even see. They're way back behind that wall back there doing video things. And uh, we're so grateful for you folks. We really are. Thanks for what you do. Um, So Zechariah, we're coming to Zechariah this week. We have started in Genesis each week. We've looked at a different book of the Bible. Next week will be Malachi, the very last book of the Old Testament. And then we get to go into the New Testament. Incidentally, and I didn't plan it like this, maybe God did. Christmas time, we get to start the New Testament. How appropriate is that? And so we'll do that. I'm actually, the the Sunday after Thanksgiving, I'm going to take one break from this series and and preach a sort of a Thanksgiving service sermon. I don't do that very often because it's too hard. Um, It it just really is, you guys. You know, there are so many different days to observe and celebrate, and I'm just not creative enough or smart enough to come up with something good to say on all of those. In fact, you know, if I'm here with you for 20 years and we got four weeks of Advent, I don't know that I got... 20 times. I don't know if I have 80 Christmas sermons in me, really, you know, and so we just go through the word and do the best we can, but there's some things I want to say uh, about Thanksgiving um, uh, on in two weeks from now. Next week, we'll be in Malachi. This week, we are in Zechariah, next to the last book of the Old Testament. Do any of you watch college football yesterday? And uh, there were a couple of good games, and that Oklahoma-Oklahoma State game was really, really good, wasn't it? Unless you graduated from Oklahoma State. And uh, I mean, what a game. That's the way the rivalries ought to be. They ought to come down to that last play. In fact, Texas-West Virginia had something just like that the week before where West Virginia was down. They had, I think, four seconds left. They were down by one. They went for two. They got it. It was win or lose the game. I love a decision like that, don't you guys? And, man, it was just the right call. So Oklahoma State copied from West Virginia's playbook. Never mind that their kicker had already missed an extra point. But they're down by one, a minute left, go for two, And the quarterback throws it like six feet behind his receiver. Oh, man. Made Zach Tonroy really happy. (laughs) I don't think anybody else in the room cared that much, but (laughs) the Tonroy house was was really happy. Oh, my word. Stop that. (laughs) Forgot about you, Josh. (laughs) But I just wonder how much second guessing is going on. And how much they'd like a do-over. You wonder as the coach going, man, we should have just gone for one. I think it was the right call, especially since their guy had missed one. But that quarterback, you think he wouldn't like to have that play one more time. I mean, the guy's a good quarterback. He played a good game against a hard team. And he just missed the throw. Wouldn't he love to have a do-over? You ever wish you could just have a do-over? I mean, maybe you've even done something that cost you more than a football game. And you just think, man, I wish I could go back. And we just, I know we set our clocks back, but we don't set time back, do we? Zechariah is actually speaking to a nation that is getting a do-over. But it's not just the nation that's getting the do-over. It's the people in the nation that are getting a do-over. They're getting a second chance. And maybe you're somebody who just wishes you had a second chance at things. If you do, you need to know that Zechariah, from start to finish, is a message for you. It's an opportunity to start fresh. 
Zechariah is a contemporary of Haggai that we talked about last week. And Haggai and Zechariah were sent. You remember the, the, the Babylonians had, had conquered Jerusalem and taken the Jews into exile. But now they were letting them go back to rebuild their temple. And so they got to go back to rebuild their temple. And they started by laying the foundation and then they just stopped for 16 years of doing nothing. So for in 520 BC, God sends Haggai and Zechariah to preach to these people, to stir them up, to preach his word to them, to stir them up, to get busy, to finish the temple. And these are two prophets preaching at the same time with two separate messages. Haggai's message was, hey, get busy, get to work, stop lollygagging. Zechariah's message is not get busy. His message is get right. He says, the reason you stopped working is because you're not right with God. The reason you wound up in exile is because your forefathers weren't right with God. And you're here now, and right now, God is giving you another opportunity to get right with him. Now, a lot of you might not be familiar with the book of Zechariah, but if you've read the New Testament, you have seen a lot of Zechariah. Zechariah is referenced 67 times in the New Testament. In fact, 54 separate passages of Zechariah are mentioned. It is one of the three most referenced books in the book of Revelation, Isaiah, Ezekiel, and Zechariah. So you have seen it in there. Most of the references have to do with the suffering and the betrayal of Jesus. Now, obviously, we can't cover it all, and we're actually going to do this fairly quickly today. But I want to do just a brief, and I do mean brief. Last week, we read the whole book, right? Because it was two chapters. We're not going to read all 14 chapters of Zechariah, so take a breather. So we're going to cover it very quickly and then come back, and I just want to point out what the main message is in the book of Zechariah. The first six chapters contain eight visions of God's rule. Now, I'm just going to tell you, if you want to read through Zechariah, the first eight chapters are hard, or the first six chapters. They're just hard. They're hard to read. They're what we call apocalyptic literature. There's a lot of apocalyptic literature in Ezekiel and in Daniel and the book of Revelation scattered throughout the scriptures. And, and apocalyptic literature is not what the contemporary mindset is about apocalyptic. When we think about apocalyptic, we think about destruction, right? But that's not what apocalypse means. Apocalypse means a revealing. In fact, the, really, the, the title of the book of Revelation is the apocalypse. It's the apocalypse because the word for apoco- the word that we get revelation from is the Greek word apocalypsis, which means a revealing or an unveiling. And so what we see in apocalyptic literature is God is revealing what's going on in the spiritual world behind what we see in the physical world. So he sort of pulls the curtain back, if you will. He pulls the curtain back between the physical and the spiritual realm and says, hey, this is what's really going on because we have a limited view. We see what's going on, but we don't see what's happening on in the spiritual. And so when he does that, imagine that they're trying to describe in human terms spiritual realities. And so what we see is a lot of bizarre, I mean bizarre imagery. And what we need to do from that is look and not get bogged down in all the little details, but say, okay, what's the, big, what's the point here? What's going on? Let me give you just an example from Zechariah chapter 5. When we see Zechariah gets this vision of a basket that has a lead cover on it. Zechariah 5, beginning in verse 5. Then the angel who talked with me came forward and said to me, Lift your eyes and see what this is that is going out. And I said, What is it? He said, This is the basket that's going out. And he said, This is their iniquity in all the land. And behold, the leaden cover was lifted, and there was a woman sitting in the basket. And he said, this is wickedness. And he thrust her back into the basket and thrust down the leaden weight on its opening. Then I lifted my eyes and saw, and behold, two women coming forward. The wind was in their wings. They had wings like the wings of a stork. And they lifted up the basket between earth and heaven. I said to the angel who talked with me, where are they taking the basket? He said to me, to the land of Shinar to build a house for it. When this is prepared, they will set the basket down there on its base. What in the world? It's just a strange way for God to say, look, I'm taking all the sin away to a far place. 
That's all he's saying. But in the spiritual realm, we're presented with this really bizarre vision. Well, these chapters, hard to read as they are, are significant. They tell us what really, every time we're reading apocalyptic literature, we're confronted with the same message. And the message is this, God is always at work. And what he's doing is affecting everything. We, just, we, don't, we don't see God at work all the time. And that's why he keeps telling Zechariah, Zechariah's put in this place where the Samaritans had caused the people to stop their work. The people have gotten lazy. They're not doing anything. And they have this huge task. And God is saying, Zechariah. And what he tells him over and over, look, look, look. Not just because he wants them to see the visions, but I want you to see, Zechariah, I'm at work. You need to know this isn't all on you, Zechariah. This isn't something you need to come up with a plan for. I've got the plan, Zechariah. I am at work. I am doing it. This is an important reminder for us because we don't always see him at work, do we? Sometimes he hides himself. But he's always working. And you need to know that you're in a place right now where I hear this all the time. People are asking me, where is God? What is God doing? I don't understand. Has God left me? No. Never. He's at work. He just doesn't always show himself. But he's at work. He's behind all the details. And and you need to look for him for one thing. I think a lot of times we're not really looking for him. What we're doing is we're saying, God, I want you to do this in this way. And we stare at this. And God's working all around us. But we can't see him because we want him to do exactly what we tell him to do. Right? And God's saying, hey, if you'll just look over here, you can see all the stuff I'm doing. But then sometimes he just hides it all from us. And you know what we have to do then? We just have to trust him. We have to trust him. We have to believe him. We have to take him at his word. We have to trust his promises. This is what we've been singing about today. Is when we can't see God, when we don't know what's going on, we have to trust that he is still the king on his throne and he is at work. We move into chapter 7 and 8. We see this glorious promise of divine peace. And we see that the true thrust, the true meaning of God's word is something deeper than a lot of times we make it. And he rebukes these people for their merely outward expressions. Notice I said merely outward. We should have outward expressions of what we believe, but the outward part is in all of it. And they're doing all these religious observances, but it's just external. Zechariah 7 in verse 4. Then the word of the Lord of hosts came to me. Say to all the people of the land and the priests... When you fasted and mourned in the fifth month and in the seventh for these 70 years, was it for me that you fasted? And when you eat and drink, do you not eat for yourselves and drink for yourselves? See, they're doing all the fasting and all the feasting that God told them to do, but only as it suited themselves. It didn't come from their hearts. And we get to to verse 8 of chapter 7. He shows just how hard their hearts had been. The word of the Lord came to Zechariah saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, render true judgments, show kindness, mercy to one another. That's a word we need today, isn't it? Show kindness and mercy to one another. Do not oppress the widow, the fatherless, the sojourner, or the poor. And let none of you devise evil against another in your heart. But they refused to pay attention and turned a stubborn shoulder and stopped their ears that they might not hear. They made their hearts diamond hard, lest they should hear the law and the words that the Lord of hosts had sent by his spirit through the former prophets. Therefore, great anger came from the Lord of hosts. God says, I kept sending the prophets, and y'all just covered your ears. When we get to chapter 8, verses 18 and following, he shows us what it's like when we get to the heart of worship, which is something that comes from the heart. Verse 18, chapter 8, and the word of the Lord of hosts came to me saying, thus says the Lord of hosts, the fast of the fourth month and the fast of the fifth and the fast of the seventh and the fast of the tenth shall be to the house of Judah seasons of joy and gladness and cheerful feasts. Therefore, love, truth, and peace, joy, gladness, and cheer should mark the people of God. And when it does, look what happens. Verse 20, thus says the Lord of hosts, People shall yet come, even the inhabitants of many cities. The inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us go at once to entreat the favor of the Lord and to seek the Lord of hosts. I I myself am going. Many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem. 
and to entreat the favor of the Lord. Thus says the Lord of hosts, in those days ten men from the nations of every tongue shall take hold of the robe of the Jews, saying, let us go with you, for we've heard that God is with you. You know, people are just not interested in a dead, joy, joyless religion, are they? Who wants to be a part of something like that? You know, back when I was a non-Christian, that's what I saw a lot of times in a lot of people who were church people. It was just dead. There was nothing there. There was no joy. There was no excitement for the Lord. You know what I even found? Most of the church people I knew never even talked about Jesus. Can you believe that? They just kept, they just went on about their business. No joy, no cheer. But when people can see the joyful vibrancy of a living, life-giving faith in the people of God, they'll be drawn to what we have to offer. This is teaching what the rest of the Bible teaches. This is exactly what happens when you're born again. When you're born again, your religion can't be lifeless anymore. When you're born again, when you have a new nature, when God quickens your soul and brings that spark of life to you and you are adopted as a child of God, there is a life that comes in you. I didn't say you just get giddy and you're happy all the time, but there's a life and a vibrancy. This is why Jesus says he came to give abundant life. That's the kind of faith God will use to draw the nations to himself. Is that the kind of faith that you have in Christ? Is that what your relationship with Jesus has done for you? When we get to chapter 9, chapter 9 through the rest of the book, through verse 14, it's just all about Jesus. It's really cool, man. Y'all, this is, this is 500 years, over 500 years before Jesus comes, and it's all about him. Chapters 9 through 11 are about this shepherd king who people are going to hate. And here's where you'll start recognizing some of Zechariah. For example, Zechariah chapter 9, verse 9, which is just quoted in Matthew 21. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous. And having salvation is he humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Y'all recognize that in the New Testament? This is what happens at the time he enters into Jerusalem during his last days. Chapters 12 and 13 are about the shepherd that people killed. I want to show you, this is one of the most fascinating verses, I think, in all the Bible. It is so rich and deep. Just look, chapter 12, verse 10. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy... So that when they look on me, on him whom they've pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. This is so cool, you guys. I hope this, if y'all can't get just excited about God's word, go to Zechariah 12.10. It is so cool. Let me tell you what's going on here. Who's speaking here? Who who is speaking here when he says, I will pour out on the house of David? It's God. It is Yahweh. It is the one true God. And back in verse 1 of chapter 12, he identifies himself as Yahweh, as the one true God who created all the heavens and the earth. So that's who's speaking. And he's the one who's going to be pierced. Do y'all see what's going on here? I'm going to tell you, those religions that deny that Jesus Christ is 100% God, that deny the deity of Christ, like the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, this right here, this one verse will lay them flat. It undoes everything they believe. You can't say you believe in the Bible and don't believe that Jesus Christ is God because right here, the prophecy about him that is actually quoted and referenced in John chapter 19 as being about him by the apostle John says that the one who created the heavens and the earth who is speaking through the prophet Zechariah is the one who will be pierced. And not only that, he's the one who is going to pour out a spirit of grace And he's going to pour out pleas of mercy. And you guys, we saw this happen in Acts chapter 2. So the one who has been pierced, past tense. So he's speaking about this one in the future. Something that's going to happen after he's pierced. By the way, this word pierced is a unique word that means pierced as with a sword or a spear. This is talking about when Jesus was pierced in his side by the spear of the soldier. But after he's pierced is when he's going to pour out the spirit of grace. So it's after, this is talking in the future, after the crucifixion, 
There's going to come a time, and we see it in Acts chapter 2, when God pours out the Holy Spirit, a spirit of grace, and he pours out pleas of mercy because what happens on the day of Pentecost when Peter gets up and preaches? The people go, what do we need to do? They're pleading for mercy. And he tells them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, for the forgiveness of your sins. And 3,000 people came to Christ that one day. All of that, you guys, the Trinity, the crucifixion, the resurrection, and Pentecost are all in this one verse. Isn't that fun? Thank you. You, Come on, guys. This is fun stuff, y'all. Oh, man. All right. Chapter 14 is all about the consummation of the kingdom at the end of, the time, at the end of time. I, I want to read to you Zechariah 14, verses 6 through 9. And those of you that are familiar with Revelation chapter 21, I just want you to see some of the parallels here. You're going to see a lot of this stuff just playing out. Chapter 14, verse 6. On that day, there will be no light, cold, or frost. We could use that today. And there shall be a unique day, which is known to the Lord, neither day nor night, but at evening time there shall be light. On that day, living water shall flow out from Jerusalem, half of them to the eastern sea and half of them to the western sea. It shall continue in summer as in winter, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Zechariah is such a hopeful book. God used Zechariah to encourage these people. And and man, I just pray you leave here encouraged today because of what you hear about Zechariah. And there's really one main point. We look at all this stuff in Zechariah. There's one main point, and we find it in the first six verses. So if you have your Bible, chapter 1, the first six verses. In the eighth month, in the second year of Darius, the word of the Lord came to the prophet Zechariah, the son of Berechiah, son of Iddo, saying, The Lord is very angry with your fathers. Therefore say to them, thus declares the Lord of hosts, return to me, says the Lord of hosts, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. Do not be like your fathers to whom the former prophets cried out, thus says the Lord of hosts, return from your evil ways and from your evil deeds, but they did not hear or pay attention to me, declares the Lord. Your fathers, where are they? The prophets, do they live forever? But my words... My statutes, which I commanded my servants, the prophets, did they not overtake your fathers? So they repented and said, as the Lord of hosts purposed to deal with us for our ways and deeds, so has he dealt with us. This is a plea to turn or to return to the Lord. This word for turn is the word that's translated either turn or return, depends on the context. If you've been walking with the Lord and you've strayed, it's a call to return. If you've never walked with the Lord, it's a call to turn to the Lord. Now, this is important because the plea is coming from God. God is urging people, turn to me. He's calling, he's drawing, he's pulling them. This is what he does. You know what we read in Romans 3 in the New Testament? This is one problem I have with what we call the seeker-sensitive movement. How many people does the New Testament, how many people does Romans chapter 3 say are actually seeking the Lord? Zero. There is none who seeks God, not even one. Left to ourselves, we do not seek the Lord unless the Holy Spirit draws us. This is why Jesus says in John chapter 6, verse 44, he says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him to me. And that's what God's doing. He's drawing these people. He's wooing them. He's calling them, saying, come back. Come to me. God's in the business of drawing by his Spirit and through the preaching of the gospel. I love what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 5.20. He says, therefore, we're ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Zechariah is making appeal on behalf of God. The Apostle Paul is making appeal on behalf of God. And you guys, I'm doing the same thing today. On behalf of God, I implore you, I appeal to you to be reconciled to God. What's really cool, I'm quoting from from 2 Corinthians 5.20. As soon as you get to the very next verse, it's the gospel in one verse. It tells us, it's what we call the great exchange. It tells us that Jesus, who knew no sin, actually became sin. He became, he took on himself, the one who never sinned, all the guilt, all the shame, all the punishment, all the everything as our substitute. And he exchanged our unrighteousness, our wickedness, our sin for his righteousness. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. You see, here's the problem. We need to be reconciled with God. 
You know, one of the things that grieves me so often is I see people and I talk to people who have not placed their faith in Christ and they say, oh, I'm good with God. No, you're not. The Bible says you're not good with God. You, you have a broken fellowship, a broken relationship with him. You're not right with him. And Jesus came to reconcile us, to bring us. This is the problem with the world. It's, 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 it's people are not right with God. And he brings us back. He brings us into that relationship with him. So what's happening is, is Zechariah shows up. Haggai's saying, get to work, a needed message. And Zechariah's saying, yeah, but you got to get right with God. The reason you stopped working is because your, your fellowship with God is not right. You need to get right with him. And the Lord stirred their hearts through that message. And I have been praying and praying that the Lord would stir hearts today. That the Lord would stir the hearts of those who need to turn to him today. He uses this lesson from their forefathers. He reminds them the reason of their defeat, the reason they're in exiles. He kept sending these prophets and they wouldn't listen until after they were punished. And his plea here is don't wait. The prophet's dead. Your forefathers are dead. But the word of God is alive. Don't wait. You know, maybe you're sitting here thinking you got plenty of time. I got plenty of time to get right with God. Maybe you do. Maybe you do. You may have another 50 years. You can keep putting it off for 50 years. Maybe it'll, it'll be all right. And maybe you don't. Man, what a gamble. What a gamble. I'm just going to trust. I'm going to have all the time I want. Man, that's a, that's a faith and confidence I don't have. And that's why this is a new opportunity. I wonder how many of you realize what a gift is today for you. Just the day itself, it's a gift. I've talked to a couple of people today. I said, how you doing? Great. Every day I get out of bed, it's a great day. How often do you think like that? Man, I got up, I got out of bed. But not only that, I want you to think about what a special gift that today is to you. And bear in mind, it's not because you got to hear me preach. But it's a gift that God woke you up today. That God brought you here today and that you've been exposed to the word of God that says you have another opportunity. You have another opportunity. Today is your opportunity to get right with him. If you've ever wanted a do-over, if you've ever wanted a second chance, this is it. Don't let it pass you by. And so here's the takeaway today. You probably knew it was coming, but here's our takeaway. Turn to Jesus today. Emphasis on today. This week as I was working on this sermon, I, I got to thinking about a guy named Bartimaeus. Any of y'all know who Bartimaeus is? Bartimaeus is a pretty obscure character. You see him in Mark chapter 9. But Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. And he goes through Jericho. And when he's outside Jericho, he's walking along. And you know, geez, man, every time Jesus went anywhere, crowds were all over him. I mean, I look at celebrities today and I think, man, I'd hate that life. They can't go anywhere in peace, you know. People are mugging. That's the way what Jesus was a celebrity back then. And people just flocked to him. And he just loved him and was gracious to him. Anyway, he's walking along and there's this blind guy named Bartimaeus. And what do you know about blind people, man? People who had any kind of disability back in that day, they were unclean. So here's this guy. He's sitting beside the road. He's a beggar. That's the only way he can get by. He's a beggar. And he cries out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And you know what the crowd does? Hey, shut up. Leave him alone. But you know what Bartimaeus does? He starts crying louder. Jesus, have mercy on me. And Jesus just did what he does. He turned to him. He said, what do you, what do you want from me? He said, I want to see. He said, we're going about your business and see. <laughs> he could see. Here's why I was thinking of Bartimaeus. Jesus was walking by Bartimaeus. This was his opportunity. What if he had said, you know what? There's a big crowd. I'm blind. What if he had even cried out the first time? They told him to shut up. And he thought, oh, I better just, I better wait. There'll be another chance. But Jesus was headed to Jerusalem to die. And he never came by that way again. And Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus, 
acted as if that was the last opportunity he would ever have to encounter Jesus. And he was right. And I urge you, I implore you, I appeal to you today, live like this is the last opportunity you will ever have in your life to get right with God and turn to Jesus today. Let's pray. Holy Father, I am praying that in this room you are drawing people, that you are stirring hearts, and that you will lay it on people's hearts that, you know, I may live another 50 years, but I'm going to live like this is my last opportunity, and that today they would come and be saved, be reconciled, be made whole, that they would receive that do-over, that starting afresh in you. God, let it be done today. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.